Hello and welcome to the second part of the JR Biotech Data Analysis Workshop. This session will cover SNP and GWAS data analysis. I would like to encourage everyone who has not listened to the concept of GWAS and GWAS analysis to stop this video and watch the lecture by Dr. Seth Murray. And if you are new to our programming, I will also encourage you to listen to the first part of the data analysis workshop before you proceed with this session of the workshop. My name is Catherine Dumaygona Clement, and I will be um, taking you through the uh, tutorial for this section. By way of introduction, I would like to let you know that there are other platforms aside from R that you could use to analyze your GWAS data. You could use the command line and some Python scripts and some softwares that only works with Linux. But for this workshop, we are focusing on R. I have listed tons of R packages that you could use to analyze your data. We have Sniffasus. Into source plot, Gnabel, RLblob, GWAS2, Stats10, GWAS, Summer, and other packages you could find online when you Google. Just make sure that any R package you use has been used by others before, and the R package has been published in a good journal and is reproducible. The R package I will be using today is the RLblob and the script that I have shared with all of you is available free online on this website. You could go there and take a look. And the data we will be using is also a data provided on the website as well. So the first thing we need to do um, to start this workshop is to load our environment, is to load the data set. So when you go to session, you click on load workspace. And then you go to where you downloaded the GWAS data and you click open. Once you open that, um, you would find all of the Geno data, the map data, and the Pheno data. These are the three data sets that you need in order to start the analysis. So the location where I had downloaded my um, GWAS data is in my GR Biotech workshop and that is where it is. So I just loaded the environment. But if you do have your own personal data, you could read in the data using a read.csv by saving your data in a .csv file and reading it into R. So once we have done that, now we need to load the package. I will be using RLblob package for this tutorial. And I will also be using the carplot package. So if you have not already installed these two packages, you need to use install the packages line of code to install the R packages. I have already installed this um, packages, so I do not need to install to use install the packages. So I will just activate this package by using the library function. I will put my cursor on the line of code and click run. And that library has been activated. And then I also activate the car plot. So um, I am going to comment out this line because we have already loaded our pheno data. So um, once we have done this, we need to now um, format our phenotypic data. So we have already seen what the pheno data looks like. We could do a view of the pheno. And this is how the pheno data should be organized. You should have your genotypes in the first column. You should have your environment, which could be treatment or whatever it is you're looking at. And you can have your yield or whatever trait of interest you're interested in. It could be plant height, it could be seed coat color, it could be whatever disease resistance or whatever trait of interest that your project is centered on. And then we also need to see what the format of our SNP data needs to look like, which is the view.geno. And we have over 3,000 um, SNP markers. So your genotype should be on the row and your markers should be on the column. 
and then we also need another data which is called the map data and when you view the map the map data provides the location of those SNPs on the genome so the first column is the chromosome and the markers shows the position of the markers on the chromosomes and the location of those markers in the chromosome. So these are the three files that we need for in order to proceed. So now that we have imputed the data, we have seen the format of the three data that we need for the analysis. We need to test for normality. In order to use this R um, package, for your analysis, your data needs to be normally distributed. So we could take a quick look at the yield data. This is the phenol column yield. If we do a histogram of that data, the data looks normally distributed, but you could still see some outliers. In order to test for normality, we will be use the Shapiro wheel test using the Shapiro the test function in R to test the um, yield column in the phenol data for normality and the p-value is 0 0.007 which is less than 0 0.05 this means that we have to reject the null hypothesis that the data is normal so if the p-value is less than 0 0.05 the data is not normal because we are rejecting the null hypothesis it means that we need to either transform our data using all the transformation um, avenues available, you could use the log transformation, query transformation, and other types of transformation, or you could just take out the outliers. So when we do a box plot of our yield data, which is the column in the third column in the phenol data, we will can easily see the outliers from the box plot. So now we need to um, give um, generate a new object called outliers to have all of the outliers so we could take them out from the phenol data. So these are all the outliers that are available in this data set and there are about 10 of them. So we need to take out those outliers so that our yield data or our trade of interest can be normally distributed. So after we take out using this line of code which is minus which phenol yield is an outlier we're taking out all of those 10 outliers from the phenol data and we need to retest the phenol data to make sure that our data is normally distributed. And the result of the retesting is a p-value of 0.01, which shows that we are accepting the null hypothesis that our data is now normally distributed. So if the p-value is less than 0.05, our data is not normally distributed because we're rejecting the null hypothesis. But now that our p-value is greater than 0.05, our data is normally distributed based on the Shapiro um, normality distribution. We also need to remove all the missing data. We need to exclude those from our pheno data. So we use the na.omit um, line of code and then our phenol now has all of the missing data removed. So we could do a view of the new phenol after removing um, all of that, and um, you could see the new data. So if we do a dimension of the new phenol data, you could see we have 9, 22, and 3, 3 variables. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that is a new dimension of the phenol data after we remove the 10 outliers and um, we have removed all of the NAs from our phenol data. So now we are going to move to the SNP data analysis. I also want to know, make you, I also want to you to take note that I have listed um, other R packages that can be used for SNP data analysis. I have used some of this before. You have Ape, Adagenet, Apparent.R, SNP Relay, Genotype R. VCFR is used for the variant call. If you have a huge um, SNP data 
from variant calling from GBS, you could use the VCFR, you could use the popper and fly tools. Just make sure that any R package that you're going to use has been used by others before and is reproducible and that R package has been published in a good journal and has been tested. So um, now that we um, have our SNP already imputed, <clears throat> we need to filter our SNP data because our SNP data, if you're using data from GBS, GBS has a lot of missing data. The data that we have also has a lot of NAs. So we need to filter our SNP data and exclude markers that has a certain percentage of missing data. We need to exclude individuals that have a certain percentage of missing data. And we also need to exclude individuals that have a certain percentage of heterozygous individuals. That threshold can be determined by the researcher or whatever threshold you would like to use. So in some of the R packages that I listed above for SNP data analysis, they already have a function that does all of the filtering for you. You just have to type in that line of code already in the function to do the filtering. But R O blob, we need to write a code to define the function for the filtering. And we will be defining the function um, using filter.function, you could name the function whatever you want. And the function is going to have four parameters, which is the genotype data, what percentage of missing indiv markers with missing um, 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 data, what percentage of uh, markers with, what is the threshold of missing markers, of missing data in the markers do you want to exclude, what is the threshold of, of missing data in the heterozygous that you would like to exclude? So the first aspect of the function um, addresses the individual that missing, which addresses the percentage of missing information in individuals you would like to exclude. And the next one addresses the missing markers and the next line of code addresses the heterozygous individual. So after you define all of that information in the function, you need to do the first filter, which um, filters the individuals with a certain percentage of missing markers you would like to exclude, individuals, um, markers with a certain percentage of missing data you would like to exclude, and the second filter will filter the the individuals with certain number of heterozygous you would like to exclude. And the last, this returns the final um, filtered SNP data that has all three parameters filtered. So now that we have defined a function, we need to run that function. So you need to put your cursor at the function line. And now we have the function, which is, um, um, filter.function, we have that function created, and we will now use the filter.function to filter our genome data. So if we use the function filter.function, the first parameter is the genome, which is your SNP marker, and we want to exclude individuals with more than 40% of missing data. We want to exclude markers with more than 60% of missing data, and we want to exclude um, individuals with more than 2% of heterozygosity because oat is a self-pollinating plant. And after we do that filtering, and we do a dimension of uh, genome that filtered, you could see that the number of markers has reduced from 303,600 plus markers to 3,268 uh, markers. And the number of individuals have, have gone down from 329 to 328. So once we are done with the filtering our SNP marker, we need to impute the SNP marker into, uh, we need to impute the SNP the SNP marker 
using either the mean or the EM method by replacing all of the missing values with either the mean of the marker or using the EM algorithm. So in this workshop, we, could, we will be using the EM method. So the imputation, for the imputation, you need to use the a.math function, which is in the RL blob package. You just type a.math, the genotype, which is filtered, which we created in the step above, and you have to specify the impute method. You could use either the mean or the em. And we want to return the imputed true. And you can also specify the threshold for the minor allele frequency. So we want to ex we, we 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 set our threshold for the uh, minimum marker allele frequency at 0 0.05. So um, we just run that line of code. It's going to take a while because we have 3,000 plus markers. So let's wait for that to finish running. It will take a while because we have um, a lot of markers and a lot of individuals. So, um, so this is the imputation step, and we have just finished imputing our genotypic data, which is your SNP data that you have filtered using the EM method. And now we need to um, create an object for the kinship. So the imputation that we just did above, the column A is the kinship matrix. So we're going to give that kinship matrix to an object called Kmart. So Kmart now contains our kinship matrix. And our new genotypic data, which has all of the missing data replaced with either the mean or the EM algorithm, is the imputed column from the imputation step. So we're going to give the impu impu imputation column imputed to the new genome, the GWA. So that is now our new genotypic data. So now we can view the first five rows and the first five columns of the new genome, the GWA. And you can see that the NAs have been replaced by the EM algorithm. So once we have imputed the data, we need to move ahead with um, accounting for the population structure. So the population structure is accounting for the percentage of variation that occurs from principal components. And for that, we will be using the SVD function in R. The other R packages that are listed above for SNP data analysis each have a function that could um, plot the principal components and provide the population structure information that is required for the GWAS study. So first we need to center our new geno.gwas data which has all of the NAs replaced. We need to center that and then we need to use the SVD function to generate our PCA. And then um, the genome that scale, which is centered with the SVG column V, will give you the principal components, and we will give that to object PCA. So now, if you want to view the PCAs, we're just going to view the first five rows and the first five columns. And this is the PCA for the first five rows and the first five columns. So um, now we want to generate a script plot to look at um, the percent variation explained by first few principal components. So this is the script plot, and you could see the variation explained by the first 10 principal components. And um, you could see that the um, principal component um, 1, 
two, three, four, five, six. I mean, the line begins to become stable um, from principal component six. So, but anyway, the first two principal components will um, add the first two principal components are the principal components that we will be using in this analysis. So let's look at the amount of variation explained by principal component one. That will be um, SVD column D for the first one, that will be PC1, is explained by 8.6%. Principal component 2 explains 5.2% of the variation. Principal component 3 explains 4% um, of the variation. And principal component 4 explains 4% of the variation. So now, um, now that we have um, gotten the percentage of variation explained by a few of the principal components, we can plot the principal components based on PC1 and PCA2 and um, put the percent of the principal component and color the... So, um, and so this is the PC component. So. Now that we have done that, we need to look at the clusters. So right now you cannot really see the groups because we are yet to cluster the group. The, um, we're yet to do the clustering. So we will use the Euclidean distance to um, generate the distance for the clustering. And we'll use the hclust, our function, and the wad method. And um, here, if you specify two, two groups based on the scree plot, and you do a table of the groups, you would have 251 individuals in group one and 77 individuals in group two. And when you do plot the PCA, you could see that it's now colored in two groups. And we can come here and decide that, okay, based on the scree plot, we want to pick maybe six principal components. If you put six and you rerun the line of code and you rerun the table, you could see the number of individuals in those groups. And if you replot the PCA, you would see that all the groups are now colored with a lot of admixture going on in the population. So now that we have generated our K matrix, which is the kinship matrix, and we have also generated our uh, population structure, we can proceed with matching the phenotypic and the genotypic data, getting ready for the GWAS analysis. So the first thing is we need to match the pheno data with the individuals from the genome data. Remember that we did filter the genotypic data. So we have excluded some individuals with a certain percentage of missing marker. We want to make sure that the phenotypic data have the same individuals as the genotypic data. So this line of code does that for you. And this one, we also want to make sure that um, everything is the same with the genotypic data as well. So um, this is a function that we would require to prepare our phenotypic data for the pheno.gwas. So this data has to do with the model that matrix, which has the environment and the data pheno. And then we need to do a data frame of the pheno and the, the individuals, which are your genotypes the X, which is the model that you created, the yield, which is the pheno column yield. So now that we have our pheno.gwas, this is how our, the, um, geno, the pheno the pheno.gwas data should look like. So moving ahead, we need to make sure that our geno, the gwas has the same, um, has the same row names as the phenotypic data as well. We need to match all of those. And we need to make sure that the row names in the geno data are the same with the row names from the pheno data. And next, we also need to match, make sure that the row names from the genotypic data is the same as what we have from the kinship matrix. 
And we also need to do the same for the K matrix. And we need to do the same for the pheno GWAS. We need to make sure that everything is in sync with the genotypes in the row names that is in the KMART. And we need to make sure that we have the same information in the pheno.gwas as well. So when we are done matching the geno, the pheno, and the kmat row names and column names, now we need to match the genotype with the map. Remember that the map gives the information of the location of the SNP markers and the chromosome on the entire genome. So you need to match that information and rearrange your genotypic data. So now we are matching the map column markers with the column names of the GWAS data. So now that we have done that, we need to also match the column names of the GWAS data. It has to be the same column names with the map of the markers. So now we also have to reformat the map data by making sure that the markers, the map markers column have the same column names as the, the geno.gwas. So the final um, step is, the, is to generate the final geno.gwas data, which we'll, we will need for the GWAS analysis. We need to do a data frame that combines the geno, the GWAS, that combines the chromosome information from the map, that combines the location, and um, that will be our final GWAS, which is called geno, the GWAS2. And when we do a dimension of, um, you could see how many rows we have and how many uh, columns that we have. So now um, you can take a look at the pheno.gwas. This is it. After formatting and matching with the genome and the uh, population structure and the KMART, and this is how the KMART should look like. So now that we are done with formatting all of our pheno and the genotypic data, I would encourage you to go over this um, section of formatting the data in order to proceed with the GWAS analysis, I will encourage you to go over this step and make sure that you have all of your data formatted in the right way. So now we need to do the actual analysis. So for the actual analysis, we want to uh, consider four models. The, four, the first model will be a GWAS analysis without accounting for kinship and without accounting for PCA. So K will be equal to null and PC will be zero. The second model of GWAS, which will be the GWAS result two, will only account for the PCA, the kinship matrix will be null. And the third model will be the GWAS results three, which will be accounting for the kinship, which is K dot mark. And the number of PCs will be zero. And the last model will account for both the Kmart and the number of PC, which is six, which is the population structure. So um, because the PC1 and PC2 only accounted for about 14% of the variation in the individuals, it might not have a lot of effect in the GWAS analysis. So just keep that in mind. So um, now that we have um, all of our data formatted in the way we need to format it, now we need to type in the GWAS function. And the GWAS function requires your pheno data, requires your geno data, requires um, the fixed, which is our column names, and it requires K, which is um, the kinship matrix. It requires a number of PCs, which will tell you uh, which um, accounts for the population structure. It also accounts for the minimum allele frequency, number of cores has to do with um, how many cores you have on your machine and the capacity. And um, if you want to plot the 3D plot or not. So yeah, we want to plot. So our plot is true. 
and so yeah these are the parameters that we input in the GWAS function of our, our block so this analysis will take a while to run so um, because um, the GWAS will be testing each of the 3000 plus markers so we need to um, be patient and wait for the GWAS to finish testing so the trait is killed, the variance component has been estimated and is now testing the markers. So this is for the first model. So we are running, we will run all four models and generate the QQ and Manhattan plot and compare the results and um, interpret what all of that means. So the first um, model has finished running, so we will run the second model, which um, accounts for just the population structure. So right now, R is testing the markers uh, with just the population structure without kinship. And because we, we added, um, when we said plot equal true, you could see the Manhattan plot on the right hand side, but this is uh, not the final plot because we need to do the Bonferroni correction and the FDR correction to see the threshold of where the heats for the GWAS lie. So now we, we are running the third uh, model, which accounts for just the kinship matrix, which is uh, k equal k dot mark. k dot mark was created when we did the imputation of the SNP markers, and the column A was our kinship matrix, and the imputed column was our geno.gwas without the missing data. So now this our third model we're running only accounts for the kinship matrix and does not account for the PCA. So now we will run the fourth model, which accounts for both the kinship matrix and the PCA, which we um, selected to be six. So the GWAS results will be the GWAS result, which is the null, the one that has no accounting for structure or kinship. GWAS result two will be the uh, accounting for just population structure. GWAS result 3 will be accounting for just the kinship and GWAS result 4 will be accounting for both the kinship and the population structure, which is the PCA. So now we do the result, we, we do a structure, we want to see a structure of the GWAS result. So the first three columns are the information from the markers and the map. The last um, four columns will be the result from the GWAS. And this is already a minus log 10 p-value, so you do not need to transform this data. So this is another option for the QQ plot, so that you could see um, what that entails oh yeah so this is how the qq plot looks like and this is without accounting for kinship and pca and um, you could see the red line and um, um, this is this is um, for the null this is more like a negative control the second one which accounts for pca you could see that the red line is close to the black line and it's almost fit, but um, 
it is an improvement from the previous graph which is which is null yeah and you could see that the heats are different from um, you could see that the you could see the difference in the graphs so next we need to plot the the Todd GOS result which is the one that accounts for the kinship and you could see that it is indeed very close to the black line and it's almost a one is to one fit and for the last one which accounts for both let's plot that and see and yeah you could see that both the model that accounts for just the kinship and the model that accounts for the kinship and the population structure are a good model to use in this scenario. So you just have to decide and take a look at the QQ plot and decide which of the models you would like to use for your analysis. But yeah, all of this um, QQ plot shows you the information that you need to know. So now we need to do a false discovery rate and the Bonferroni correction to draw a line for the hits and um, this is the function for the FDR and we also have the Bonferroni correction and this will give us the um, FDR cutoff line so the Benferroni is much more conservative, so you would have to decide what is your cutoff for um, identifying the GWAS heats that you're interested in. So now we will be plotting the Manhattan plot for the first model, which is not accounting for kinship and not accounting for population structure. And we will be drawing the AB line for the Bonferroni correction. And we will also be adding the AB a B line for the FDR yield. So the different colors represent the different chromosomes, which is the information you will get from the map data that is required for the GWAS analysis. You have to have the map data. So next, um, we will plot the second model, which only accounts for the PCA. And the second model, you could see number of PC is six, and you could see the cutoff line, you could see the GWAS hits, and you could see the Bonferroni and the FDR. And next, we need to plot the third model, which only accounts for the KMART. And you could see all of the hits and all of that, and you could compare. And the last one is the one that accounts, is the model that accounts for both Kmart and number of PC. And you could see the cutoff line for the Bonferroni and you will see the cutoff line for the false discovery rate. So if we want to know what are the hits for a particular GWAS model, so let's take a look at the hits that we have. So we want to know what hits for the first model. For the Bonferroni correction, these are the hits. And for the FDR, these are the hits. Remember that the Bonferroni correction is more conservative than the FDR uh, correction. So for the first model, these are the hits for the Bonferroni. And these are the hits for the FDR. So for the second model, these are the hits for the Bonferroni. And these are the hits for the FDR. For the third model, these are the hits for Bonferroni, these are the hits for FDR. And for the um, last model, these are the hits for Bonferroni and these are the hits for the FDR. They sort of have very similar hits based on this, this data. So now if we want to know what are the markers for those hits, so um, GWAS results 3 and 4 have the same hits, which is true. But GWAS result 1 and 2 are the ones that are kind of different. And you should know that um, the population structure only accounted for about 14% of variation in the individual. So it didn't have a lot of effect on the GWAS. So you couldn't decide to use either the third or the fourth model. And the GWAS hits are the same for the third and the fourth model. So um, 
we want to see what markers are there and we also want to see what markers are in the second model because the second model has an additional hit on 1428 so um yeah so once we do all of that now we need to do a correlation matrix for the marker so this is markers.gwas result for the bonferroni so we decide to use the bonferroni instead of the fdr and here is marker that result to you that bonferroni you could decide to use the fdr and then include the numbers for the fdr instead of the numbers for the gwas in fact i think we could do that right now so um this is fdr so i'm gonna copy this guys And um, so this will be our GWAS result for FDR. So we need to change this to, well, I'll just leave it as F, as a uh, Bonferroni, but this should be FDR. But you should know that this is FDR, okay? Because then I'm, I'm going to have to change, well, I'll just change that. FDR, and then the marker result for, let's use the FDR. Let's decide to use the FDR. So for uh, result 2, the FDR will be this. Yeah, I think we have similar hits, but we'll see. So remember to put your commas in between. And then we can run the correlation for those markers and see if those markers are close to each other or not. So yeah, marker result that Gino will give us the GWAS result. Three and four have the same thing. And um, yeah. So moving on, we need to load the FD, the core plot. We already loaded the core plot. And now we need to um, run the correlation matrix. Perfect. Oh, okay, I need to change this to FDR. Perfect. So now that we are using the FDR, we have more markers. Remember that when we did the Bonferroni, we had just one, two, three, four, we had five markers, but the FDR, we have two, four, six, seven markers. And you can see the correlation of those markers. The dark blue lines indicate higher correlation and, and all of that. So, um, yeah, so you can see the correlation of the markers. And these are the markers that needs to be validated in other studies. And you should know that GWAS is not an end. GWAS is supposed to be something that you could actually um, test those markers to make sure that those markers actually affect the phenotype of interest. So moving ahead from GWAS, you need to either edit this region in the plan to check the phenotype to see if that actually affects the trait of interest. If not, you need to validate the study. So in order to say that these are the markers that control a trait, you need to do further analysis, you need to do further functional studies to make sure that these uh, markers are actually responsible for the trait of interest that you're interested in. So I know that um, this is the end of our GWAS tutorial and workshop. If you do have any questions, please send an email to the admin team of JR Biotech and um, we will respond to your questions on Saturday. And I know that I had included bootstrapping and phylogeny in the course outline. 
but I will not be um, be addressing phylogeny and bootstrapping. I have included a link in the script that you could look up and um, explore and learn on your own. Bootstrapping is very computationally intensive and it will take us a long time to do a bootstrap and understand how all of those things work. So I've included a link to a free tutorial online that you could look and understand what all those things mean. And if you do still have any questions, feel free to send the admin um, the questions and we will address those questions on Saturday the 22nd. Please, if you have your data, I encourage you to format your data and um, load your data and follow this tutorial. And I wish you the best. I'll see you guys on Saturday. Bye.